Oh. It's supposed to be widescreen. Can we, can we get a full screen image? Is it possible to... No? Too late? <laughs> well, hello everybody. My name is Alexander Pope. I'm super excited to be here. There's been lots of storytelling at this conference, and I love a good story. This story is a bit different. This is a scary story. And like the best scary story, it's all true. Mostly. Now, this talk is called Outbreak. Index-SW-9A-4C-43-B4-B4-77-8-E7-D1-CA-619-EAA-F5-AC1-DB.JS. <laughs> Here we go. In the corner of a functional, though charmless, open office, Ale Alexander sits at a desk, staring intently at the screen. A phone rings in the background, momentarily disrupting the early morning stillness. Hey, wow, you can import analytics data into Can I Use? And it looks like we already have over 50% service worker support. Alexander, it's still considered experimental. The specification has not yet stabilized. Nah. That's all they were talking about at Google I.O. Service Worker is the best thing since Ajax. And it's already huge in India. Be not the first by whom the new are tried, nor yet the last to lay the old aside. Be not the first by whom the new are tried. The following morning, in a cramped meeting room, Alexander enthusiastically sketches on a wall-mounted whiteboard. This is great! It's basically a proxy server in your browser. You just call Navigator, Service Worker, Register, with a path to your script. It returns a promise, so that's cool. Alexander, I hope you are aware that the Service Worker lifecycle is non-trivial. There are many opportunities for error. No, 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 no. This is the web. If something is broken, you fix it and ship it. Continuous delivery for the win. At Google I.O., they recommended you just change something. The service worker will be invalidated and reinstalled. Eventually, anyway. Within 24 hours, at least. Fools rush and where angels fear to tread. Days later, Alexander hurries to clean up commits while rebasing a git merge in time for release. The desk is littered with disposable coffee cups. Embed unique asset names. Add feature flag. Use cache first strategy. Add cache expiry logic. Cache all API JSON data. Add app shell. Add online, offline status messages. Remotely log errors. Alexander, haven't you forgotten something? What about testing? Testing service worker is hard. So many globals. And that installation lifecycle. Things are working fine locally. And anyway, it's progressive enhancement. The most positive men are the most credulous. Several weeks pass. In the quiet of a darkened living room, Alexander anxiously scans error logs. Notification alerts pierce the silence. Type error? Undefined is not a function? Not a function? How could I at serviceworkerglobalscope.o not be a function? What the hell is going on? I don't get it. Things have been running smoothly for weeks. The only change here is some refactoring. How could cache at all be undefined? It works fine on my machine. Versions of Chrome prior to 46 did not ship with cache dot at all, among other differences. The specification is still unstable, as you are well aware. Shut up! You are not helping. I need to focus while I revert these changes. One week later, back at the office, Alexander puzzles over the latest error logs. That's weird. It's been almost a week since I reverted those changes, but there are still lots of errors. It shouldn't take that long to upgrade. It's just not possible. The logs say otherwise. There have been more than 2,000 errors reported in the last 24 hours alone. 
more weeks pass. Visibly tired and distraught, Alexander slumps over his computer at the dinner table. A baby cries in the background. This is starting to freak me out. I don't understand how there can still be so many errors. And it looks like, it looks like they're coming from inside the house. Alexander, don't be ridiculous. The errors are clearly not coming from inside the house. Is it me? Are they inside me? Am I infected with these errors? No, Alexander, you are not infected. It would appear that, for a small number of clients, index-sw-984c43b4b4777e7d1ca619aaf5ac1db.js has been permanently installed. What? Permanently? It can never be upgraded? Like some kind of dead zombie oh, service worker? That is correct. You fucked up. You fucked up big time. <laughs> a scary story. I promised you a scary story. This is as scary as it gets. Now, there's something strangely compelling about a disaster story. Sometimes the disaster is an act of God, sometimes it's man made, but the best of them have this in common. The central characters are faced with difficult, sometimes impossible moral dilemmas. As viewers, we ask ourselves, how would we act in such a situation? Could we handle the pressure? Would we make the same choices? Would we do the right thing? Some of my favorite disaster stories are about epidemics or disease outbreaks that threaten humanity. Think of Night of the Living Dead. 28 days later, 12 monkeys, Children of Men, and many, many others. Now, all of these movies, they, and the entire zombie genre, really, were influenced by this book called I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Now, the book has been adapted three times for the big screen, and my favorite version is this, this one in 1971, called The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston. I love it because it's just so 70s, even though it's set in the future. And Charlton Heston, he just can't stop delivering cheesy one-liners, no matter what happens to him. He is part of the dead. He has no place here. He has the stink of oil and electrical circuitry about him. He is obsolete. You are discarded. You are the refuse of the past. You're full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> the antagonists in this version are more human than the vampires and zombies of the other adaptations. And I like that this cult of albino mutants spends all of its time raging against the science and technology that they blame for their fate. In most zombie stories, of course, they don't plan on turning people into zombies. It just sort of happens by accident. And it's usually because technology goes a little out of control. Now, as I struggle against my own mob of out of control, zombie service workers, I began to worry about this risk of technological backlash. As web developers, we're often tempted to throw more and more technology at the problem. But if we aren't careful, we risk angering our users, making things that are slow or annoying or insecure or just full of bugs, or it really risks alienating the people we're trying very hard to make happy. Before we get back to our story, I wanted to talk a little bit about JavaScript. This is a JavaScript conference, after all, not a film history class. But before we dive in, just in case some of you are wondering what exactly a service worker is, here are some of the basics at a very high level. A service worker is a script. It's installed via a web page. It runs in the background. It gives you the power to control asset caching, to handle requests from clients when offline, and to respond to incoming push notifications. A service worker is a type of worker, so it doesn't have access to the DOM, AJAX, or local storage. It does have post message, though, for communicating with clients, fetch for accessing the network, and index DB for storage. 
Now, service workers, they have a life cycle. And it starts with registration when the file is downloaded and executed. It then enters the installation phase when the install event is triggered. If there's already an older version installed it's, that's actively controlling clients, the service worker is going to enter what's called the waiting phase until all these clients have been disconnected. Next, it moves on to the activate activation event. Um, when service worker, it's when it's safe to start controlling new clients, when all those other clients have disconnected, then it's con considered to be activated. Finally, when the activation phase is over, the service worker is running, and it's able to respond to client requests via the fetch event handler. Service Worker also has new toys, including the Cache API, which lets you store network requests and responses, the Clients API, which manages connected clients. These are pages. Think of tabs, windows, and web workers, and the Push API for managing push notifications from remote servers. Now, if you're thinking, this is really complicated or this is totally over-engineered, you're correct. But there are reasons. And the most important things to consider are that service worker scripts are software. They're installed on users' devices. At the same time, they're servers. They can have multiple windows, tabs, web workers connected at the same time. So basically, the API needs to cater for two very difficult things. It needs to keep things updated and keep things up and running. Now, with that out of the way, we can get down to business. How do we avoid the zombie apocalypse? Or some things I wish I knew before I started working with Service Worker. A lot of this is going to be quick and might be over your head, but don't worry. One day, if you need it, it's on GitHub. Now, number one, understand how promises work, but use async await. The Service Worker API takes promise use to really new extremes, so using async await can make things much more legible. Although browsers have only recently begun, begun to support this natively, uh, it's just syntactic sugar over generators with promises, so you can easily uh, convert async await to use generators. Using Babel with the async to generator plugin will do this transformation for you, but keep in mind that you're going to have to minify with an ES6 minifier like Babel minify or uglify ES. Number two, don't register the service worker while the page is loading. Bandwidth and CPU time has to be shared while the cache is being filled during the service worker's installation phase. So wait until window on load or some other signal before registering your service worker. Number three, know your dependencies. During the installation phase, passing a promise to event wait until is going to delay service worker activation until it's resolved. However, if that promise is rejected, the service worker is not going to be installed. Instead, it's going to be thrown away and it's going to be marked as redundant. So in the installation phase, generally you want to start pre-caching your assets. So any asset that actually fails to load is going to cause that service worker to not be installed. So just keep that in mind. Consider pre-cached assets hard dependencies. Number four, cache smarter. When upgrading a service worker, it's common to pre-cache assets in a new, uniquely named cache uh, before you start deleting the old caches during that activation phase. Now, in most cases, this is a really good approach. However, if you release often, you can avoid wasting storage space and bandwidth by only fetching new assets and recycling the old ones. So you can create more than one cache. You can have a cache for static assets that won't change, and other caches for versioned assets. And then you can copy existing versioned assets from the old one to the new one. Now, obviously, this is not as easy as just calling cache at all, but it is more efficient. Number five, you should avoid forcing activation for major changes. Forcing activation after an update can break already connected clients if the new service worker is really different than the old one. So you should avoid calling self skip waiting after that major change. Instead, consider notifying the user 
to, up, to actually refresh the page instead. Use a library for messaging. Messaging between service workers and clients can be a bit awkward, so using something like Swivel can really make things easier for you. And number seven, this is very important, never rename the service worker file. Once the service worker has been installed and activated, eventually it has to be updated. But if the file, the HTML file that registered the service worker is also cached, you cannot install a new service worker with a different name. So you can avoid this chicken and egg problem by making sure that the service worker script file name never changes. It should al always, always be the same. So along with that, you need to set the correct cache headers, of course, because the service worker script is going to be retrieved from the browser cache if it exists before it's retrieved from the network. So you need to set correct cache control headers for that script file. Otherwise, it might cache outdated versions. So as a precaution to avoid accidentally installing service workers for days or weeks or months, the browsers are always going to go to the network if it's older than 24 hours, regardless of what you set. Number nine, invalidate your service worker when it's updated. You can do this, a very nice pattern is just to treat the service worker as a bootloader, and you call import scripts with version file names, and that'll, that's basically all you need in your service worker file. And that will be invalidated when the dependencies are changed. Number 10, you should add a feature flag or kill switch. So in the event of disaster, which sometimes happens, Having an easy way to disable the service worker can be a real lifesaver. So you can add a feature flag to control unregistration. You can keep an empty sort of no-op service worker handy for quick deploy. Or even better is you can have the service worker itself phone home to see what version is the latest version, and then it can update itself if it's outdated. Number 11, don't cache bad responses. So you should always check the OK property of the response object before you put it in the cache. HTTP error codes won't cause the fetch to reject. So the fetch promise will not reject if it's anything over 200. So you should always check first before you cache it. Number 12, don't store global state. Storing global state in a service worker is really dangerous. Uh, anything outside of the event handlers is going to be erased every time it's started. And Basically, service workers are started and stopped many times over their life's lifetime. And that's to save battery, save resources. So never store anything outside of these event handlers. Number 13, guard against missing APIs. A number of API methods were added later, um, so it's wise to test whether they exist before calling them. So here are some examples from Chrome, some older methods. Um, so if you Supporting older browsers, you should also check to make sure they exist. Number 14, test your service worker. As you would expect, because of the installation lifecycle and the unique environment that service workers run in, it's a bit difficult to test. Uh, and that's putting it mildly. Fortunately, there are some tools available to mock a service worker and to test things on the command line. Service worker. Uh, there's a service workers toolchain by Pinterest, for example, and they developed this so they could mock it in Node by decorating the Node.js global scope with service worker methods. So you can run your code inside Node on the command line. There's also SWTestEnv, which is a bit more thorough mocking of service worker, and that lets you run isolated uh, scripts in sandbox contexts. Now, command line tests are great, but it's even better to test real code in a real browser. And to that end, I've recently got this idea that you should be able to take one test file, run it on the command line, and also run it in the browser. I call it SWTester, and it sort of builds on this SWTestEnv by adding a test server and a bunch of hacks to make it work uh, in the browser. Uh, it's still a work in progress, but hopefully at least one day, uh, the hope is that it'll make testing service worker much, much easier. Finally, number 15, use a service worker generator tool. 
If you don't want to get your hands dirty, you can use some tools at build time to generate your service worker for you. But you should always test. Still write tests for your service workers if you can. Now, it's time to get back to the story. Now that we know how to play safely with service worker, you might wonder what exactly happened. What was the recipe for disaster? Quite simply, it was one part ignorance, one part stupidity, and one part mystery. Probably not all equal parts. We know that versions of Chrome before 46 didn't have cache at all. So any client missing this API should have caused the promise return to the install event to reject. With a syntax error, undefined is not a function. Unfortunately, a catch was also added to the promise chain in order to report install errors. But that error was never thrown further up the chain, and the service worker was installed instead of being thrown away. So that explains how some clients became infected with this broken service worker. And based on the number of errors reported, we can see that over time, they were soon cured after we fixed our mistake. But it's really a mystery as to how or why a small number of clients never got updated. So even after trying to install an empty service worker, and eventually we just turned service worker feature off completely, that broken file still haunts me and probably will until every one of these devices is retired. <laughs> now, even if these details are lost on you, I hope I've at least impressed upon you how Service Worker is a bit of a complex beast. It is awesome. It's a truly awesome API, truly awesome technology, but it's awesome in the, kind of in the way that a chainsaw is awesome. It's really powerful. But it's also a really easy way to lose a hand or a foot or maybe a few toes. But do not be afraid. People use chainsaws every day <laughs> without spilling blood. They take precautions, they dress for the job, and they read the instructions. Now that I know more, now that I have the tools to use service workers safely, I'm ready to get back into the lab. And I hope that everyone here is as well, because I really think that Service Worker is the next best thing since Ajax, and I hope everyone remembers how that turned out. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Kill your bugs, not your dreams. Good boy, Alexander. Get off the stage. Thank you.